Good afternoon, one and all. I thank you for the opportunity to present to you today uh, this interesting topic of clandestine masonry in the United States of America. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, the, uh, the moderator. Uh, he had about a two-page uh, document to do my introduction. I said, where'd you get that from? He said, well, someone Googled you and figured they'll find your resume online. It's like, no, don't do that. You never do that. All right, so we're going to be a bit interactive. We're going to move around a lot because it's less about me and more so about the content that we're going to speak about today, right? So uh, first thing, when we talk about this topic of clandestine masonry, it's a big problem. I'll tell you why. We're just speaking so significantly about the definition. Each Grand Lodge in the state of the, well, in, in our country, uh, as well as other countries, actually have the unique ability to define clandestine masonry to their own desire and understanding. Some Grand Lodges don't have a definition at all. Uh, when I speak to brothers in uh, Switzerland or Germany and I ask them, well, how do you define clandestine masonry in your constitution? It's like, we don't. We have regular and irregular and that's it. Um, there are those that we recognize and there are those that we don't. Uh, when we look at the United States of America, the term clandestine as well runs into a significant issue because there are some brothers who would love to pull up uh, Webster's Dictionary and says, this is what clandestine means. The problem is it doesn't really convert over to what Masonically clandestine is defined as. Secondly, you find those who go to Mackey's Dictionary of Masonic Terms to Digest and say, this is the term. Uh, and as I indicated, there are some jurisdictions who define clandestine as simply uh, any Grand Lodge that they are not in amity with. Any Grand Lodge that they're not in amity with. It could be regular or irregular, it doesn't matter. They're just going to be clandestine to that particular jurisdiction. I have the example here of my Grand Lodge where I hail from, uh, the Grand Lodge of New York, who actually defines the term quite significantly in our Constitution in the Grand Lodge state of New York. It says, a clandestine mason is one who has received their degrees in a lodge or is a member of a body that's pretended to be Masonic, but not deemed to be uh, legal according to the Grand Lodge state of New York. The second part of this definition is quite interesting. A clandestine mason is one who has received his degrees in or is a member of a body not recognized as being Masonically legal by the Grand Lodge of New York or who is operating in a lodge that is outside of its lawful jurisdiction. Let me give you the example of that. Let's say the uh, Grand Lodge of Rhode Island decides to go charter a lodge uh, in Attleboro, Massachusetts tomorrow. By virtue of that definition, the Grand Lodge State of New York would say that the, that lodge, being a Rhode Island lodge, has violated, it's moved out of its jurisdiction of Rhode Island, invaded Massachusetts, so essentially that lodge and any members of it would be clandestine to the, the Grand Lodge of New York. That's the quick and dirty way of explaining that particular clause. Now, people always say, well, when do we hear about clandestine and people being made clandestines illegally? And I actually found this uh, document in speaking to some brothers in uh, Manchester, England. This is March 1752. It says, the following brethren, Thomas Figg, uh, Lawrence Fullard of the same lodge, uh, number two, um, had made formal complaints against a Thomas Phelan and a John Mackey. Just incidentally, not John Mackey, just another one. Uh, better known by the name of Leg Mutton Masons. Uh, what essentially happened, these guys made uh, Royal Arch Masons out of a bunch of folks uh, illegally. Uh, and when they presented to ask them to find out more details, it was said that it was in investigated and examined at the home uh, of Mackey, who had essentially uh, made apprentices uh, and had no idea or knowledge of what he was doing. Uh, and instead of told people he had deceived a long story of 12 mar marble stones and the rainbow, which was the Royal Arch, and other absurdities equally foreign and ridiculous. The Grand Committee <laughs> unanimously agreed in order that neither Thomas Phelan nor John Mackey be admitted to any ancient lodge during their natural lives. Uh, and this was actually recorded by Lawrence Dermott. Um, so even back then, we found that there were people deceiving individuals to join Freemasonry. Now, I say that and I provided that context because it's one thing I must really stress in the course of this conversation that I want everyone to understand. For the next set of slides, you will see uh, a greater uh, focus on a particular demographic within our society and I don't want you to have the false pretense that clandestine masonry is only within that demographic. In fact, we know quite extensively that clandestine masonry is pervasive but it is important for you to not just look at the uh, contextual color of the slides to think that it's only a problem. And I will address this in a second. 
So history reveals that we know that there have been men in color involved in Freemasonry almost at the, at the outset. Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de St. George, was a great musician. In fact, uh, he held uh, quite a lofty position as being uh, the chief conductor of uh, an a opera in uh, Paris at the time, and he is known to be the first uh, man of color uh, to be made a Mason in France. Uh, in fact, his music, uh, and he's, he's, he's affectionately called the Black Mozart, but he actually predated Mozart uh, and has had significant musical scores that are still available to this day. Uh, Andrew Solomon is another brother who was a member of the Lodge of True Harmony um, in Austria. And he was also interested because he came to Austria by way of being a slave initially and found favor in high society uh, and was essentially adopted by the crowned, uh, well, the crowned prince at the time uh, and being made an equal. In fact, he married a duchess, uh, divorced, uh, well, a widow duchess uh, to show how far up he made in society and was a mason. In fact, he uh, was one of the folks who recommended Amadeus Mozart to join the Lodge of True, True Harmony uh, and was known to be their director of ceremonies. And those of you who may know, um, what do I say, the Scottish Rite style of, um, of uh, bro you've, you've heard of Tarble Brother, you know, the brother that comes into the room and they're dressed in a cloak and they're just ominous. He played that role quite extensively. And we also know that um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and anyone know who Jack Johnson is, the, the, bomb, the boxer? You know he was a Scottish Mason. Uh, in fact, uh, he was made a Scottish Mason back in 1911. And our brothers from New Jersey are in the room. Uh, we also recognize that there is uh, Alpha Lodge number 116, uh, which had been the first lodge in what we call mainstream Freemasonry uh, to have essentially um, integrated by having men of color join uh, within the early years of their formation. So, as you can see, I'm going to start this conversation around the African American community for a couple, a couple uh, historical perspectives. Uh, we're going to characterize the presence of Freemasonry in the African American community um, in three distinct ways. Prince Hall affiliated, Prince Hall origin, and non-Prince Hall. And you'll understand why I go down this particular rabbit hole. Prince Hall affiliated is what is called the original, official recognized body. It is the group when we say we recognize Prince Hall that we're speaking about PHA. Uh, Prince Hall is known to be the father of masonry uh, in the United States of America and it was born in and around 1738. He was a staunch advocate for freedom, uh, for the end of slavery, abolitionist freedom uh, for, of education for women and children and also to ensure that uh, communities got an equal, equal footing. He and other 14 men were initiated uh, in 1778, uh, March 6th, uh, by a man who was a member of, Af of the uh, Irish Military Lodge 441 that was attached to uh, the, register uh, sorry, the 38th Regiment of the British Army, roughly around Boston at the time. I stress what I just said because when you read the narrative, uh, and this is based on new uh, research information, that normally the message has been that Prince Hall was initiated by Lodge 441 in 1775. We've actually found and gone back to look at primary source data and found even within Prince Hall own records that it was actually 1778. And it wasn't by the Lodge, but was by one person, John Batt. Now, these are the founders of the African Lodge. We know that they have purported to, and they did uh, exist as a lodge. We see their records. Uh, they were very, very staunchly uh, excited about their Freemasonry. And while they had a limited status, they were able to at least bring other brothers into their fold. Now, here's where the story has an interesting twist. We know that two of those brothers were uh, seafaring men. They worked in the mercantile industry, and they found themselves in London at the time. They found themselves what we call destitute and uh, applied for some assistance. Uh, essentially, by doing that, they had to present themselves to these brothers in this lodge, lodge called Brotherly Love Number 55, and were found to be legitimate uh, in the eyes of those brothers from England. Being so excited at the fact that they receive honorable treatment, uh, they wrote back, and when they got back to Boston, told Prince Hall, hey, we were treated as equal by these brothers in London. Uh, and they recognize our signs, they recognize ourselves, and they provide us with assistance. That uh, essentially started an intense interaction between Prince Hall and the master of uh, Brotherly Love Lodge in London at the time. In fact, the best way I can determine, I can say it in today's um, language, they became Facebook friends. 
Um, they started communicating back and forth. Prince Saul started to let him know about the growth of their lodge and things that was, were troubling him. And Moody said, well, why don't you apply for a word or a charter from the source, the Grand Lodge of England? So Prince Hall did this. He wrote, for a, he wrote a petition and sent this into England at the time, uh, roughly about 1784, March 1784. September of 1784, John, William Moody obviously had uh, good friends within the Grand Lodge because you're talking about a three-month turnover of the request from the charter to when uh, the charter was actually granted. Uh, so we know in September 1784, the charter was given by the Premier Grand Lodge of England. It didn't get to America until 1787. Nonetheless, we know that at that point, uh, that Prince Hall Lodge that was operated in Boston called Bo uh, Africa Lodge No. 1 became legitimized by virtue of becoming on the rolls of the Premier Grand Lodge of England as Lodge No. 459. They started to uh, intense correspondence. They paid into the charity fund. And there's tons of records, letters back and forth between the, the Grand Master, the Grand Secretary of the Premier Grand Lodge of England and Prince Hall for on and on about how they were doing. Now, we know with the uh, fight between the ancients and moderns, there was a unification into the United Grand Lodge of England in 1813. At that time, Prince Hall's Lodge, 459, and many other lodges, not only in America, but outside of the English world, were stricken from the rolls. 459 was re-added to the rolls and given a new number, number 370. Nonetheless, they still operated as such with 459. Now, this is an image of the charter. Some of you may have seen this, others may not. It's damaged here in the top right corner because there was a fire where the Prince Hall Grand Lodge uh, burnt, and the Grand Master at that time rushed in, saved the charter from being burnt, and uh, first they had it encased in plastic, now they have it actually encased in glass, and in a security uh, deposit bank, or in a secure bank um, here in Boston. In Boston, I didn't say here in Boston, but in Massachusetts. I'm gonna pause for a second because while we are in 2016, I must underscore the fact this document, this charter, was for over 200 to 300 years a sore topic for some or a champion um, artifact for others. We have scores of documentation, letters, um, edicts, um, and communications that we've seen in American Freemasonry that excoriated uh, the, the, the existence of this charter by many in the mainstream Freemason. Either they said that this charter was not, didn't exist, it's not real, it was obtained illegally, uh, and as virtue of that, uh, many folks would say the Prince Hall Grand Lodges were clandestine. Others, of course, who were part of either Prince Hall Masonry or other, or uh, as we've seen in the Grand Lodge of Washington, said that no, uh, this charter is legal, uh, and by virtue of that, it's no more different than any of the charters that we uh, have uh, have essentially enjoyed by having Freemasonry in this U.S. But a lot of it was based on the color of the skin and the racism that existed in this society at the time, why folks felt that uh, men of color could not be Masons. And by virtue, a lot of folks would have said that Prince Hall, and not would have said, did say that Prince Hall Masonry was clandestine. But in actuality, we find that upwards until 1827, they operated independently. And then was when Prince Hall Grand Lodge formed itself into Africa Lodge number uh, Africa Grand Lodge, which later on became the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Recognition did not extend to the Grand, Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts until 1994 by United Grand Lodge of England, the mother of Grand Lodge. Ironically, this was caused by virtue of about 10 U.S. Grand Lodges, including Connecticut and um, Washington, who said, enough of this, we recognize Prince Hall Grand Lodges as being legitimate, and we don't care if England doesn't do so. Uh, and later on, England essentially moved its dial and essentially declared its recognition. Now, I'm just going to go over quickly why this whole conversation about Prince Hall came into existence. Many folks say Prince Hall Grand Lodges are not legitimate because they didn't form with three Grand Lodges. Because you need three lodges, I'm sorry, they didn't form with three lodges when they form into a Grand Lodge. Because the rule is you need three lodges to form a Grand Lodge. Here's the problem. We know in the 18th century, there were three Grand Lodges in North America who were not formed by three lodges. 
One of them, the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, was formed not even by Grand Lodges, but by a convention of Masons. So if you look at how Freemasonry operated in what I call the wild west of the time, if we're going to administer the same rules for Grand Lodges that we deem uh, to be regular and we recognize as such, why is it that there's, an ex there's a different uh, set of uh, rules or requirements for others? So according to the Grand Lodge of England, they said by the standards then prevailing, the formation of the African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts may have seen as been eccentric. But by the standards of their unusual transformation, their work is essentially um, valuable, legitimate, and worthy of being recognized. And we see uh, after that, uh, many of the states essentially entered into recognition with their Prince Hall Grand Lodges within each of their states. And as you notice, with the exception of nine states at this moment, do not share recognition or amity with their sister Prince Hall Grand Lodges and they're located in the south, southern eastern component of our uh, great nation. But I will bring some pause to that. Understand that it's a two-way street. And we know that there's some Prince Hall Grand Lodges by virtue of the strength uh, of their uh, commitment and the history that they have uh, endured over the course of time actually have no interest in uh, gaining into recognition uh, with their sister Grand Lodges, meaning the mainstream Grand Lodges, and vice versa. So it's not only one-sided, but I would say it is a hugely, hugely intense conversation to have because it's really uh, fostered on lots of years and years of hard feelings and discrimination on multiple sides of the aisle. Anyone knows the Buffalo Soldiers? How many knew the Buffalo Soldiers were members of military lodges? You put your hand down. You saw this before. I'm joking with you. <laughs> Actually, uh, many of the men who formed, uh, were part of the Buffalo Soldiers were uh, members of, uh, of military lodges that were under the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas and later the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri. And we see them here in their Masonic regalia and we know that they were uh, very significant heroes in the world of what we say American history by securing our borders over the course of time. And here we recognize that uh, they've received upwards of uh, 18 Congressional Medals of Honor. And they're Prince Hall Masons. Uh, I have images here of Prince Hall Masons also who uh, formed the first Grand Lodge in Pennsylvania. This is Reverend Absalom Jones, who is also responsible for founding the African, uh, Episcopal, Methodist, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church, which is a very uh, strong and historic church in the African American community. Uh, and we know that they have been quite extensively focus on a very uh, familial and, and, and really respectful understanding of the craft in they being proud to be members of regular Freemason. Grand Lodges upwards of 47, uh, I would say over about 300,000 members worldwide, Prince Hall affiliated is a regular entity. Now, we're going to go to Prince Hall origin. You probably never heard of it, PHO. Um, it's regular by lineage, but it is an unrecognized body. Here's why. Well. Let me take you down history for a second. You heard about the Baltimore Convention? Baltimore Convention, a couple of Grand Lodges came together and said, we want to you know, work together on a couple issues. The one thing I would let you know that came out of the Baltimore Convention, uh, well, two things. One, it was where the dues card was invented. Seriously. This came off of the heels of the uh, Morgan Affair and you know, people had all these Masonic rituals that are out there pretending to be Masons or trying, get, trying to gain access to lodges, Grand Lodges shutting down, etc. So the idea was that we create a dues card so we can, we can identify who is a legitimate Mason for not. So the Morgan Affair found an American innovation, the creation of the dues card. And also, uh, they're responsible for the idea of putting forth uh, starting business in the lodge on the third degree versus on the first, as you find in other parts of the world. Now, similarly, the Prince Hall Grand Lodges had a convention in 1847 in Boston. And the members of this convention, or the delegates, were as followed. African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, Hiram Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, Boyer Lodge of New York, and First Independent African Grand Lodge of North America, Pennsylvania. What do you notice? Who's paying attention? Two Prince Hall Grand Lodges in Pennsylvania. How did that happen? So 
There are a couple of guys who were in the original Hiram Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. They got kicked out. They decided, screw you. We're going to make our own Grand Lodge. First independent African Grand Lodge of, of, of North America. That didn't just end it. They started beefing with each other. And instead of making, as I would say, you know, Facebook, you know, uh, flame posts, et cetera, they just put it in a newspaper. So they were going after each other, writing documents, and you know, really, really very uh, nasty to each other. So African Grand Lodge in Massachusetts said, enough guys, let's, let's figure this thing out, let's come together, let's bring Boyer in from New York, who is known to be uh, a very prominent, prominent lodge in New York. Now, here's what transpired. They came out creating this most worshipful National Grand Lodge of Ancient York Rite Masons, also known as PHO Compact. It conceptually created one National Grand Lodge that was over all of the state Grand Lodges in Prince Hall uh, lexicon, which is a total novel idea, right? They, in turn, are responsible for creating 30, 23 additional state Grand Lodges between 1848 and 1877. They are, uh, I would say, um, did contribute, they are, I would say respectfully so, uh, they did contribute to the uh, normalization of the ritual within Prince Hall by making a standardized uniform work, but they were very much significantly uh, proponents of the Underground, underground Railroad, which essentially allowed for enslaved uh, men and women of African descent to be uh, escape uh, slavery in the South and be uh, into uh, northern states and, and free states in Canada. But here's what happened. They formed this group. Then you started seeing withdrawals. You start the Grand Lodge is leaving. Lodge left 1848. Hiram left 1849. The other Pennsylvania Grand Lodge left in 1850. Ohio left in 1867. And then the original Massachusetts Grand Lodge left in 1873. The whole idea was that there were some Grand Lodges that were members of this group that said, we're enough, we, we have a problem with the, uh, with the power struggle and the irregularity of the formation of the organization of it. Others have said, we wouldn't join it anyway, so get out of that thing. And then we find that most Prince Hall State Grand Lodges we drew, and if you listen to the narrative, the Prince Hall affiliate guys would tell you the National Grand Lodge ceased to exist at that point in time. However, we know that they continued to form new Grand Lodges in the places that left, and were in direct competition with the Prince Hall origin, uh, affiliated guys. It still exists to this day, they're a very small footprint, but Many of these guys would tell you that they believe that they came from the same origin as Prince Hall affiliated and have the right to exist, even though they would be technically considered either distant cousins, but really uh, clandestine by virtue of their origin. Now, why did I say they're unrecognized but regular? We know that there is no standard that permits you to have a national Grand Lodge over state Grand Lodge. That kills the whole idea of sovereignty. Secondly, we also know that uh, while there are one or two Prince Hall Grand Lodges, while they're regular, uh, originally came from the regular origin and never left the compact. That's uh, an example, the state of Delaware. PHA and PHO, uh, Hatfields and McCoys, that's the best way I can say. You don't ever want to mix them together, it's oil and water, because the whole idea and the pride of being PHA uh, is, is really uh, taken to task when they see these guys that are PHO that also use the name Prince Hall, whom they feel are physically and purposely deceiving the rest of the world to say that they're also Prince Hall. So we know that few of them have either adopted or absorbed uh, many of the PHO guys into their lodges, but you never, you're never going to see them together at a dinner table. So, which brings me to the third aspect of my conversation, the non-Prince Hall. And I say this because of one big problem that oftentimes happens. Let me say it as well. Not every man of color that you see that has a screen compass is a Prince Hall Mason. And not every Prince Hall Mason is a man of color either. Uh, we do know that they're man they, they have uh, members from all walks of life. But the non-Prince Hall groups that I'm speaking about are spurious, illegitimate origin, uh, fake, uh, straight up bogus uh, pyramid schemes, irregular, not acting in accordance with the rules that we have for mas Masonic um, etiquette and, and uh, protocol. Anyone know who this guy is? John G. Jones. Heard his name before? Except Ed. <laughs> John G. Jones is known as the father of bogus masonry in the US. He was born in 1849, he was a New Yorker, Ithaca, New York. His family moved to, to Illinois, uh, Chicago. He's a lawyer, that's not why he's the father of Bogus Masonry. Um, he was a state representative for Cook County, that's not why he's the father of 
It's masonry. He actually had a very strong Masonic resume. Right? He was a member of the most wonderful uh, John Jones Lodge Number no. 7, uh, which was named after his uncle, who was a past grandmaster of Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Illinois. He served as master, was elected as grand secretary twice, was even elected as deputy grandmaster. He was responsible quite significantly for the growth of Prince Hall Scottish Rite. Uh, and significantly as well, he was the founder of the Prince Hall Shrine. If you look at history of Prince Hall Shrine, this is the guy that created it. Now, why is he the father of Bogus Masonry? He got into trouble with his grandmaster in around 1887, was suspended, but then was restored. He ran for elections for sovereign grand commander of the Prince Hall Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. He lost, and when he lost, he and other members of his crew essentially reformed this group called the United Supreme Council South and West Jurisdiction where he became the sovereign grand master and essentially said, you know, he's all supreme and he can create grand lodges, grand commanderies and everything else across the sun, which he did. Uh, therefore, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of not only Massachusetts, but Ohio brought charges up, I'm, I'm sorry, Illinois, brought charges up against him. He was found guilty, suspended indefinitely and kicked out of uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry. But that didn't stop him. He and other members of his crew continued to form new grand lodges, and new supreme councils. So because I'm from the state of New York, I will illustrate to you the legacy of John Jones. These are all Grand Lodges that exist in the state of New York. Primarily, though, the two in red are ones that he is responsible for forming. So you see here, it's 1907-1908. John Jones is listed in their history books as being part of the formation. I'll pause for a second. How many of you knew there were that many Grand Lodges in the state of New York, except that? <laughs> How many of you thought there were only two Grand Lodges in the state of New York? The Prince Hall Grand Lodge and Grand Lodge of New York? Great. Because the list is not over. <laughs> it's crazy, right? But wait. <laughs> There's more. 1975, 1993, 91, 74. I mean, my brothers, even more recently, we've seen Grand Lodge formed in New York as late as 2016. New York Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons Incorporated. I'll tell you how these guys do it. Very simple. Brother, what's your name? Tim? What's your last one? Delaney? Brother, Tim Delaney and I go to the Secretary of State and we say, we're going to pop down $300 and for the Tim Delaney Grand Lodge Ancient Free and Accepted Incorporated. We get a certificate that says Certificate of Incorporation for our Tim Delaney Oscar Most Social Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Incorporated. And then we go to Matt McCoy's, buy a $5 certificate, put our name on it, and we start saying, okay, let's start bringing members. We go to um, Barnes and Nobles um, and buy Lester's Look to the East or Ritual to say, this is our new ritual we would adopt for our lodges. And we just set up shop. We buy fancy aprons, and you'll see fancy aprons in a while. And we just essentially uh, make sure that we continue to bring people in and develop our, our Grand Lodge. A few months ago, brothers sent me this text. Like, brother, we, Oscar, we just left Grand Lodge. We went around the corner. We saw this on the light post. It says, the Grand Masonic Chapter of New York, apply now, GMC New York at yahoo.com. It's totally legitimate, right? <laughs> totally. Now, I'm in Massachusetts, so I must share. These are illegitimate Grand Lodge that exists or have exists in the state of Massachusetts. Did you know you had these? Now, New York has the undue honor of being the one state with most of these Grand Lodges. But California is right behind us. Then we're followed by Illinois, then Texas. Pennsylvania tries, but for the most part, the top four are New York, California, Illinois, and Texas. Now, I bring up this next slide because 
It's a bone of contention and a real area of misunderstanding in this whole context. We've heard the term three and four letters before, right? Ancient, moderns, AF and M, AF and, AF and M. Now, in the US, the belief is that if your lodge dependent from the ancients, descended from the ancients, the Grand Lodge of Ireland or Scotland, you use the AF and AM designation. That nomenclature is why you use it. And if you descend from the moderns, you use the F and AM. There's a problem with that, and I'll walk in for a second. We know in the US that there are 25 F and AM, there are 24 AF and AM, there's one AFM, which is how South Carolina calls themselves, and the Grand Lodge of DC capitalized their little A, and they call themselves AAM. So in reality, around regular Freemasons, it really makes no difference. We know Prince Hall's Grand Lodges are F and AM. Uh, they also help form the Grand Lodge of Liberia, which is AF and AM. And Canada's Grand Lodges are AF and AM. It has no difference on regularity. And we know it's actually a self-determined de designation. Why? There are at least two or three Grand Lodges in the US who were either originally AF and M, and they decided to change to F and AM, or vice versa. You can do what you want as a Grand Lodge, right? If a Grand Lodge chooses to, to designate itself as such, it really doesn't have much to do with this whole ancients and moderns. Why? Because whether or not you're modern, you're ancient, or Ireland or Scotland, all four of those bodies are called, and in their names, are ancient, free and accepted Masons. Uh, so the idea that one's from the other is actually a misnomer for some except when you're the non-Prince Hall, Scottish Rite, um, you know, clandestine guys. They call themselves Scottish Rite Masons, and those of you who may or may not know, Scottish Rite is French and not Scottish in origin. It actually has degrees 1 through 33. However, the rule is in the U.S. that they, and most other countries, they can't confer their first three degrees because those fall under the domain of the Grand Lodges. However, we know uh, that these degrees are sometimes called the Red Craft or the, re or the uh, red, red Lodge degrees. Louisiana has about nine lodges that are permitted to do the first three degrees. Puerto Rico's have mostly Red Lodges. Uh, and we know in California, Hawaii, and New York, has anyone ever been to Garibaldi Lodge in New York City? That's an example of that Red Craft Scottish Rite degrees. So, well, I can't go into any more details because I know it's a public sign. So anyway, that's just take my word for it. The red craft degrees are much different than the quote unquote blue craft degrees. Now, many of these clandestine guys just created their stuff out of thin air. <laughs> Some of them were expelled members of F and AM Grand Lodges. Next minute, they're AF and M, and they would walk up to Prince Hall and other guys and said, "We are four-lettered. We know more than you. You have to come to us to complete your masonry." doesn't make any sense, but they believe that because that's what they've been told by men like Tim Delaney and Oscar Allen, most worship Grand Lodge, H Free Accepted Incorporated. Because that's how we keep them in. They form all these groups, they charter blue lodges in, they don't practice any of the craft degrees. Uh, and they say stuff to you that's so ridiculous, they like to engage in what we call street masonry, you know, saying little catechisms like, did you see my red dog? Just, just know they don't know what they're talking about. Um, modern free and accepted Masons, i just going to keep a quick slide on them for one reason. They were sued by the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia, and the Supreme Court in Georgia basically said, modern free, you can no longer pretend to be Freemasons, you can't use the, uh, the, the symbols and pretend that you're uh, what you're not, you must shut down. So what happened was the creation of international free modern Masons. Um, this group was created in 1950 in Detroit, Michigan. And I, I'm going to focus on them for one reason. They say that their American issue charter empowers them uh, to be the same rights of any Grand Lodge or any Grand Orient. They also say that their charter originated from the American Charter Society or the American Charter Department. There's no such thing. They went to the Secretary of State within uh, Michigan and first in, in Delaware to form. Now, this is how you know the, modern, the International Free and Accepted Modern Masons, IFAM. Two things. They wear a fez in their blue lodge. Those of you in Grotto, Shrine, and Skyot Skyot know that that's the only three places you would see a fez. But they wear their fezes in their blue lodge. They also have this key. The idea is simply modern frieze were sued for using the square encompasses illegally. You can't say I'm using the square encompasses because that's the key. <laughs> The 
this group, I would say, is one of the biggest pyramid schemes that we see exist to this day in Freemasonry. Um, they don't have a grand master. They have a grand, I'm sorry, they have a supreme CEO. They advertise the benefits of joining. They charge their members endowment fees, which they said after you reach a certain time or there's a death, you will receive monies um, from the collection of these fees. No one ever gets any money from them. Um, and they also uh, pay uh, members, um, what's the best way, kickbacks for bringing in more people. One thing, a few years ago, their tax returns, uh, they claimed about $12 million in operational budgets. $12 million they brought in from people who have no clue that they are not in a legal Masonic organization. $12 million. Now, I have examples here. Those of you who've ever been to New York City or been to Brooklyn, which is trendy nowadays. I grew up in Brooklyn, but you know, that's fine. It's trendy now. Um, there's this thing called the Brooklyn Masonic Temple. And if you go to the city and you go to Brooklyn, it's like, oh, it's Brooklyn Masonic Temple. It looks like this building. Oh, it must be, you know, where the Brooklyn Masons meet. It was formed in the 1909 and 1920s where most of our, our lodges in Brooklyn met. Then we shifted to having many of our lodges meet in Grand Lodge because we have a great edifice and things and rents, et cetera, are expensive uh, nonetheless. So what happened in 1943, we know that a bunch of guys, the clandestine guys, formed the, the Williamsburg Masonic Circle Number 1, which became Mecca Grand Lodge, which had recently changed the name to Empire State Grand Council. They have been operating, they rent this place out, you know, you have all these things going on, and people think that they're regular Masons, and they're not. It's a huge clandestine group, but they have a Facebook page, and I can't tell you how many brothers that I'm friends with on Facebook, and I see they like the Brooklyn Masonic Temple, and I'm like, hey, guys, it's not. Or guys that come into town and said, hey, I'm standing outside this building. You know, which lodges meet here? None of ours. You better leave. Um, <laughs> And these are other examples that I have throughout the city in New York of, uh, and here, this is in DC, of, of, of buildings that are designated as Masonic, but are all these clandestine groups. And if you look at these images, you can't tell the difference between regular Masons or not. I mean, you have their, tar their charter, their sashes, uh, their you know, jackets, really nice jackets. They have the shrine. They have the version of the shrine, uh, Royal Arch. Um, Let's see here, Cryptic Council, Shrine again, Scottish Rite, Templar, you know, Scottish Rite, Supreme Council. I mean, I'll tell you right now, and no disrespect to anyone here, this guy has the best jewel I've ever seen in my life. No Grand Master, even Flavor Flav can't, do, can't top that. <laughs> they even have what we, ha what we say, you know, we have our, our, our what's it? Council of Grand uh, Masters of Cogma, I'm sorry, yeah, the Council of Grand Masters, they have a general Grand Masonic Congress as well, which they come together and develop, you know, that policies or whatever they say. And in New York City, in Harlem, there's this historic African American parade every year that's done uh, since 1969. And these, is, these are all the participants that are found in the Masonic Parade section. And only one is legitimate. Now, what happened in one particular year, uh, these guys were jockeying for position to who's going to be first in the parade and were actually disrespecting and, uh, and verbally uh, trying to accost members of the legitimate Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York. So the Grand Master essentially said, everyone, we're leaving now. And they just exited and said, we're not coming back. Then he changed his mind by realizing the fact that they predated many of these groups and uh, from a historical perspective and a community perspective, they needed to be present uh, to show the community that a legitimate Grand Lodge is here and we're not going to be negatively impacted by uh, these, these folks who were looking to uh, uh, one-up them. Uh, so they have since returned to the parade and carried themselves a great decorum despite what has happened or what continues to happen. Looking at this parade, you can't tell me which one of these folks are clandestine, can you? Unless you're paying attention, you see the guy with the fez, right? But none of them are the Prince Hall Grand Lodge members. These are all men and women who are part of clandestine Grand Lodges, who march proudly, don't have a clue, nor are some who know and just don't care. Um, so 
when we used to battle these guys, right, one of the things that happened, uh, the biggest argument you can make to them is, what's the source of your, your charter? Where did you originate from? What is your validity and your credibility of your origination? And if you can't say you're uh, descended from England, Ireland, or Scotland, then we know the standards for recognition are through the roof. This group just formed in 2005, calls itself the regular Grand Lodge of England, formed in a, what we call Covent Garden, which is a pub in um, England, in 2005 of January, declared that they are older and ancient than the Grand Lodge of England. They were formed by this gentleman who uh, was expelled from the Grand Lodge of England and found out that he can make tons of money um, by recruiting many of these clandestine groups in the US, giving them charters from the regular Grand Lodge of England and forming into what they call Masonic High Councils. What is it they can say now? We, have a, we, we are no longer the Tim and Oscar Most Worship Grand Lodge Incorporated. We are now members of the Grand, regular Grand Lodge of England. We're regular, and we got it from England. They're still as bogus as bogus can be. Um, so the problem that we see that these groups have started to spread throughout many states, and they have their convention. Now, if you look at it, in those jurisdictions that don't have amity between their Prince Hall Grand Lodges and their state Grand Lodges, it makes some sort of sense, because here you have men from different colors, different backgrounds, different faiths, that coming together for this masonry. So it's an argument that one really can't, can't, can't get around. However, in other jurisdictions like ourselves who enjoy the uh, interrelationship, you really see that this can't be a problem. This group, I'll just, I'll just tell you. <laughs> World Egyptian Rite Masons are a super secret fraternal order based on the system of the ancient Egyptians uh, and the mystery system. They're so super secret, I found their information on their website. Um, <laughs> They practice a version of the Memphis Ride claim that they go to 97 degrees. This is a founder who recently died, um, and I think they've gone defunct since, defunct since. But they actually said, we're not Freemasons, we're Masons. Freemasons came from our order. We're their fathers. Worm Masonries, not, not mine, they said it. Worm Masonries has all the secrets of them, and they have none of ours. And for a right charge of $50, we can give you a get out of jail card if any cop pulls you over, and you could also help build a pyramid that we're building in, um, in uh, Chicago. There's no pyramid. Um, and there's no jail, get out of jail card. Anyone knows Dr. Conrad Murray? Ed, you keep your hand down. <laughs> All right. Anyone remembers him now? Who was he? Michael Jackson, doctor. And when Michael Jackson died and his doctor was being, you know, suspected of being complicit in his death, his lawyer rolled this out. Why? Because he's an upright man in Mason. There's no way in heck he could have had anything to do with the death of Michael Jackson. Let's examine his uh, regalia, shall we? Dr. Conrad Murray, MD, Grand Medical Director, Most Worshipful Scottish Rite Grand Lodge, Texas. This, if I can find no other way of articulating this, this is why this is not a problem for the black community only but for all of Freemasonry. When you look at the conspiracy theories or the common uh, messages that you search about, you know, uh, Conrad Murray and Freemasonry, here's what people say. The Masons killed Michael Jackson. But can you argue with them? He went to jail for it, right? He's here as a Mason, right? His lawyer rolled it. The Masons killed Michael Jackson. You guys are bad. I mean, that's, you know what I'm saying. It wasn't a reference to the song, but you know. But it's a perfect example of how the action of folks who are participating in these types of, uh, of, of organizations that can have a detrimental impact on us. Oftentimes, we found that many of, especially the mainstream Grand Lodges, stick their heads in the sand because they're saying, this is not an issue of ours. This is an issue for the Prince Hall Masons alone. But we've seen with the advent of social media and the fact that people are so quickly uh, either friending folks that have a square encompass, being up with guys and said, hey, you must be a Mason. Yeah, come hang out on my lodge. We've had an example of people being 
brought into uh, many of these lodges, and no one ever checks, no one ever checks the books, and they're not regular. Here's a perfect example of one. This guy's name is Rick Wells. He lied and said that he was a member of a Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Texas, and uh, he then got membership into Internet Lodge number 9659 in the United Grand Lodge of England. Internet Lodge is a regular brick and mortar lodge, but it allows those jurisdictions that have amity with the Grand Lodge of England to join um, electronically. So you send in your copies of your dues cards, you mail your, your stuff back and forth, you verify your existence, and if you're in amity with the Grand Lodge of England, you now become a member of the Grand Lodge of England. Here's what this guy, he's a clandestine guy, he joined, and here's what he did. He purchased the Matt Mason of the Grand Lodge of England, and he meet, went immediately to attend Harvard Lodge. Then he went and he posted his uh, visit to Harvard Lodge uh, on Facebook. Then he went back to his clandestine lodge saying that, hey, we're not clandestine anymore. England recognizes us. Well, we kicked him out. I'm a member of that lodge. I raised the flag and I spoke with the secretary and we, we provided evidence. We kicked him out roughly about 2014. This picture was taken in 2016 in a new Grand Lodge that was formed in Texas. What is he doing? He's no longer a member of the Grand Lodge of England, but he still carries himself as such. And obviously you can't um, arrest people for wearing regalia, or can you? Um, and they just love their, uh, their regalia and love signing charters and treaties with each other. So what has been occurring over the course of time, the clandestine guys are, are essentially budding up to each other, forming treaties of recognition amongst themselves. Uh, and they've even extended past uh, the African American community into European communities where you see guys coming from uh, parts of Eastern Europe who are just as bogus as these guys here in the US but they're forming an alliance and forming Voltron. Um, and here they go, you know, just all these guys. And there's another group which is uh, the Hispanic Grand Lodge of North America and their, their contention is that most of the state Grand Lodges do not permit men of Latino descent to Freemasonry or to practice Freemasonry uh, with either Spanish uh, or Latin influence. Uh, so they sign treaties with these guys and they're saying that they are, um, they, you know, everything is money. They, uh, they would give them a charter and they would allow them to um, enjoy the benefits of joining uh, Freemasonry, which we know is an actual ruse. In fact, they outdo each other when they steal money from each other. They create their own fraudulent uh, notices of, hey, don't, don't take any money from this guy. He took our, took our dollars. And you guys heard about the Masonic Police Department? <laughs> Remember that? No? No, you didn't? So about a year and a half ago, <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. A year and a half ago, a number of police departments in California were contacted by this group saying that they were, they were the Masonic Police Department. And they met with these individuals who showed up with the police chiefs and said, we are members of the Masonic Police Department. We have protected heads of state, grandmasters, uh, since the time of the Templars. We, by virtue of that, are saying that it's best to interact with us and form an allegiance and let's work out some way of us working together. The police chief's are like, who the hell are you guys? Um, they end up getting arrested for impersonating police. Uh, and the stuff hit the fan. The Grand Lodge of California and the Grand Lodge, the Prince of Grand Lodge of California all had to say, we don't know who these clowns are at all. The main guy who calls himself the Grand Master shows up to court in his regalia. And it was news for a while because everyone's like, you, you guys have a Masonic Police Department? And you can't say, well, it's the clan, it's the clandies. You can't say it because no one knows what the heck you're talking about. All they've seen is Square and Compass seem Masonic. So it must be you guys. And how are you not controlling that? And by virtue of being, you know, what we would say the conspiracy theorists, you know, who's not to believe that this isn't some of the fairest thing that you guys put up uh, others to do? So my point is that we cannot continue to pretend or keep our heads in the sand as this, 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 not, 
impact us, nor can it reach us. I mean, these guys traveling all over, showing up on TV, um, in other countries. Uh, I like this group here. Let's see, do I have a better picture of them? Uh, they're in New Jersey for like uh, $100. You can get a really nice Osiris outfit and some, you know, the, oh, yeah, yeah. If you see, he has like two bottles. It's, a, it's an hourglass, but it's basically two Coke bottles taped with electric uh, tape. I, 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 love the, I love the regalia. Um, once again, not only within one demographic, you're seeing an expansive exposure between multiple face, multiple backgrounds. You know, they have accoutrements, the, the, the Templar outfits. They love signing, they love hotel rooms and signing uh, treaties. Um, you know, and you see all the, here, here, it's a better picture. See it? That's the best hourglass I've ever seen. Um, the Moorish, the Nuwapians. That's all I'm going to say. This is going to take another hour. But essentially, this was formed by a guy called Malachi York, who was a cult leader. He's now in jail for over 100 years for um, essentially uh, taking advantage of people who joined his cult. Part of his cult was that he became a grandmaster in his cult, and then he became a higher being who had a direct link to the extra, extraterrestrial beings that control our destiny. Um, and he formed the Nuwapian Grand Lodge, and these guys all are members of it. And even though he's in jail, they still say, free Dr. York and all this other stuff. But it's a total cult and it's a total sham, and just when you see them run. Um, you know, they, they are all around, they parade around, and, and as you see, oh, the guys in the shrine, it's important for you to know this. We had some scenarios where they showed up to the, the shrine international meeting because they're shriners, right? They had Mecca number such and such. And if any of you know the shrine, there's only Mecca number one. There's no Mecca number 900, 675. Uh, so if you're in, sitting in the Shrine International, you see a guy wearing a fest that says Mecca 900, 695, you know there's a problem. So uh, they're asked to leave, uh, and I love the shrine for this, but they still took the check that they gave to donate for the shrine in the hospital. Because, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's, it's only right. Um, once again, Underscoring, it's not only within the African American communities. Yes, I started out talking about Prince Hall uh, and the Prince Hall groups that exist uh, for, the, for one aspect of the conversation. But when you look at this, you're seeing that it's more and more uh, an issue that you must be educated about. Um, like the Tower of Babel, confusion abounds. People see the square and compasses, think, oh, it's the Masons. They must be legitimate. They have all the sounding elements. They think they're regular. Uh, they think they're correct. They think they have all, uh, and they have all these other bodies, etc. They use the state corporation as their charter of, rec of, of legal uh, status. Some of them are just making money hand over fist. Uh, and we probably estimate that there are over 300 of these groups that exist in the US alone. Now, there are probably, and we estimate, roughly 70 or so, 70 to 80 ones that are not in the African American community. But as you can see, this seems to be more in the African American community than not, but it is across all of our uh, aspects of our society. So, my fact here is that we, as regular Masons, need to do three things, if we can. Educate ourselves, our members, about the existence of these groups. Take advantage of those of us who share amity with their Prince Hall Grand Lodges to interact, to illustrate the benefits of regular masonry. Third, educate your community. There are only few of us that exist, but if we know our cousins, our neighbors, understand the differences between regular Freemasonry and that's, that's, that, that that is not, it makes it easier to be police. Because I would prefer someone to say, uh, when I was 21 years, knocking on the door of Freemasonry and say, or well, you remember the Grand Lodge of New York, or you remember Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York, than finding out that after 14 years that I was a member of a clandestine Grand Lodge when I joined in college. At which point, um, I felt I was in Masonic territory because I didn't know how to become regular, and I was able to uh, figure out the process um, in 2009 when I became a legitimate member of the Grand Lodge of New York. So men like me can be easily misled, even though I was a very staunch researcher. Nothing at the time when I joined at 21 uh, years ago said to me that there's this and there's that, and if you're not part of regular Freemasonry, you, uh, you would not be able to gain the benefits of being a true and regular Freemason.
Thank you.